I'm here in Geneva, Switzerland. It's May 23rd. And <clears throat> just, uh, for, for us, there's quite a few things going on here. Uh, there is a meeting today where some of the uh, negotiators of the, of the World Health Organization are going to review progress they've made on changes in the international health regulations. In particular, there's one uh, section of the negotiation or one element that we've really been engaged in quite a bit, and that has to do with the uh, language on technology transfer. And there, uh, uh, we've worked with different countries to find some compromise that would satisfy uh, the uh, the United States, uh, the uh, the uh, the UK, um, I, I believe other members of the G7, and a number of developing countries led by uh, Brazil and uh, Colombia. Uh, and I, I don't. We'll, we'll sort of see how that how that flies. There's there's been some complications in terms of that negotiation, but maybe they'll resolve it today. Maybe they won't. There's a, a separate negotiation we're even more deeply involved in, which has to do with the, uh, the pandemic treaty negotiations. These negotiations have been just going on forever. Uh, uh, we, week in and week out. Some meetings are two weeks long, some meetings are a week long. Uh, there, there's been, in the last four weeks, there's been three weeks of meetings on the pandemic treaty uh, negotiation. And uh, 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 so, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I'm, 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 I'm here for that, and uh, uh, among the issues we follow, we're kind of interested in what comes out on the terms and conditions of government funded the intellectual property, uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, agreement is reached on what they call the peace clause, which has to do with whether or not uh, the, the party members agree not to, um, not to uh, bring trade pressures against countries that use uh, the options they have in the TRIPS agreement to do things like issuing compulsory licenses or other exceptions that may be used in the, uh, in, in when, when the when a pandemic occurs. It's a very narrow provision in, in a way because it only deals with pandemic cases. And normally you would think that, uh, hey, uh, uh, exceptions, one of the arguments uh, uh, the, the high income countries often make is you should only use exceptions in an emergency. And here, uh, when you're negotiating a pandemic agreement, there, there, there have been a lot of pushback and attempts to prevent the use of exceptions, even in emergencies. So, um, but uh, the peace clause is an attempt to kind of push back in that area. It's been watered down quite a bit. We're trying to uh, sort of see how it plays out in the end. Um, the, the, uh, the technology transfer thing, uh, there is this big push from uh, the G7 countries to have language that says that any technology transfer should be on mutually agreed upon terms, which suggests that you have to bargain with the rights holder. You can't just regulate them or mandate that they do technology transfer. And uh, to make things even uh, uh, more in the direction of voluntary, they wanted to use the term voluntary and mutually agreed upon terms, which is a, a phrase that uh, really does, you don't find it in an existing international agreement. So they're, they're trying to use the pandemic uh, treaty negotiation to set a precedent that technology transfer should only be voluntary and on mutually agreed upon terms. And uh, at the same time, the European Union is uh, considering a legislation, a regulation, which will allow them to uh, use trade secrets, know-how, samples, uh, materials, anything they need uh, 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 through a compulsory license in an emergency. Uh, the specific reference there would be uh, recitals uh, uh, that, that really explain what they're doing would be recitals 32A and 32B of the European Union proposed regulation on compulsory license in, in emergencies. And uh, the United States uh, has a, a variety of me mechanisms of doing compulsory measures. Uh, they have different, different parts of the law for patents, for example, than they have for know-how. Uh, they, 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 uh, uh, the Defense Production Act in particular has these references to what they call ancillary measures uh, to make things, uh, including uh, know-how uh, material, you know, like um, um, if you need a cell line, if you need uh, some, kind of, some kind of special material. Um, the U.S. can actually uh, take over a factory. I mean, they have like very broad powers and, and they don't just do it in wartime. They, 
even though it's, it's named the Defense Production Act, the most recent use of it was in the case of uh, 2022, fairly recently, and in in, 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 it was invoked for um, to increase the U.S. manufacturing of, of large storage batteries, for example, related to electric cars and things. And in 2020, it was used uh, uh, a, a, a lot, and it was used a lot as it relates to uh, uh, COVID-19 countermeasures. Uh, the U.S. also required, for example, uh, Pfizer uh, and Biotech to manufacture the Pfizer Biotech vaccine in the United States of America during COVID-19 as a condition of the uh, uh, financial support we had for that, for, for, for that vaccine. So uh, you have measures in the Bayh-Dole Act, like mandatory measures, like mandatory global licenses on intellectual property. You have a mandatory uh, marching right through funding agreements. You have a mandatory U.S. manufacturing clause in the Bayh-Dole Act. And I'm, I'm really uh, just scratching the surface of the tools the U.S. has at its disposal. And uh, so the concern on the technology transfer issue is that uh, uh, the G7 countries, including the United States and also including the European Commission, we're looking for language that would be um, uh, it, it, not, not legally restricting what people could do because the U.S. and the EU want to do mandatory measures whenever they feel like it, but to create a narrative that you should only do voluntary measures. And the, the, uh, uh, the effect of that would be to permit sort of basically bullying countries, uh, uh, developing countries, uh, if they tried to use mandatory measures by pointing to provisions of the agreement that said it should only be voluntary, and and even though it was even though it was uh, technically not not a not a constraint, it would kind of look like a constraint, and that's really all they need. So, we've asked that if you're going to go down that road and include language like that, which we would prefer that you don't include at all, but if you if 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 we end up there where you have that language, you have to have some clarifying language. And it begins with uh, the words uh, in, in formulations that have been proposed here by different parties by saying that the, uh, the, uh, 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 the references to mutually agreed upon terms would be without prejudice to other measures that a party may take. And then there's a kind of a, a negotiation over what would follow um, uh, the words other measures. And, and I think what uh, one formulation, which we're very comfortable with, would, would say that a, a, a me measures that are consistent with the WTO TRIPS agreement. Now, all, uh, m most members of WHO already have to do things consistent with the TRIPS agreement. There's not a big concession there. Uh, what we did not want to see is language that said that only the flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement. And that's because... Uh, a TRIPS agreement does allow for flexibility in the area of trade secrets, and it does uh, confidential business information and regulatory data, but it doesn't really go to other things in t technology transfer that you, you need to do. In particular, it doesn't really explain how you could compel someone to provide access to uh, um, uh, 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 a sample or a, a, a working cell line or uh, uh, to train workers and things like that, which are often part of actual uh, technology transfer mandates that you see, uh, and which are actually, you know, permitted in the Defense, Defense Production Act. They're, they're permitted in the new EU regulations. So uh, uh, that would be too restrictive. So the idea that the, the measures would be consistent with the TRIPS, I think, gives uh, comfort to the G7 countries that if they do go after things that are considered confidential business information or regulatory data, it would be within the framework which is set out of the TRIPS agreement, which has some, some safeguards and balancing. Uh, but we're comfortable with that. And, and, and in any case, they, they, pretty much everyone has to do that uh, anyhow, even without this agreement. Um, there, there are um, administrative procedures, uh, provisions in the, in the treaty that are really important. Uh, some have to do with how it could be amended or if you could add annexes or could you uh, establish new protocols. And partly that is a lot of the things that are in the agreement right now are fairly general and uh, aspirational. Uh, and, and, and part of it's just uh, the fact that it, it, it's really hard to negotiate a lot of really detailed things on, on dozens of different topics that are in this agreement. Um, and uh, the I think the role of the of uh, of the annexes, of the amendments, the annexes, and the protocols will be over time as parties become more comfortable, and um, 
uh, around specific things that they may want to add detail to or new commitments to. It does provide a, a framework to make it more of a living document, which we think is that um, I think makes it a more significant negotiation than maybe people r recognize by looking at the existing text right now. There are, uh, uh, of course, many other uh, controversies in the agreement. There's this big controversy over the surveillance and one health measures having to do with agriculture primarily and, uh, and animal health. Um, we're, 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 we're not really expressing strong opinions on everything that's in the agreement. There's a, 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 we've, we're, we're expecting that, uh, that to find some kind of, there has to be some kind of outcome on the pathogen benefit and, um, the pathogen access and benefit sharing system, so-called PABS system, um, or referred to as the PABS system, P-A-B-S, um, um, PABS. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the PABS is, is where, uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis uh, among some countries in putting some of the equity demands in the pathogen um, access and benefit sharing system. Our views on that are uh, different than some groups. Uh, we're really in so in many ways sympathetic to the position of, 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 of uh, 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 the United States, the Europeans, um, uh, the G7 countries and the pharmaceutical countries in, in one sense and that, and that is we really think that access, timely access uh, to information about patterns is really important and we'd like it to be as few of speed bumps as possible and making sure that researchers have access to pathogen information as, as fast as possible. And uh, there's a potential conflict between putting a lot of uh, conditions on, on that access and having the access actually happen in real life. So uh, we're, uh, 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 we would like to see as much unhindered access to the pathogen information as possible. That said, um, there's a question of how you pay for the pathogen access uh, um, um, uh, and benefit sharing system, uh, and and uh, there, there's some expense uh, that's involved in that. But also, you're a situation where the G7 countries have been blocking the equity measures in other parts of the agreement, so they've been really taking a hard line on the on the provisions and agreements having to do with the peace clause uh, and the intellectual property on the limitations and exceptions to intellectual property. They've been um, taking really hardline positions on the uh, technology transfer provisions and other parts of the agreement and the supply chain and the technology transfer provision and other, other areas there. And they have not been that forthcoming even on the area of, of, of conditions on government funding, research and development. So as they, as they reduce the benefits in terms of equity in other parts of the agreement, it puts a lot of pressure on negotiators to have them in the PABs where the developing countries feel that they have more leverage and, uh, and and that's just uh, uh, that's pretty much where things are right now. And uh, they may or may not be close to an agreement. Uh, people were kind of optimistic last night. Some some negotiators were, uh, uh, but we'll we'll have to really see. There's been a lot of kind of false um, uh, 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 optimism so far in the past negotiations. We're not really sure where where it stands. Anyway, um, it, that's a very long discussion of the discussion of the progress in the uh, in the pandemic treaty. The other negotiation that um, um, another a, a, a third negotiation we're following this week it has to do with the diplomatic conference at the World Intellectual Property Organization or WIPO on a um, a, a, a treaty on the uh, mandating the disclosure of uh, genetic uh, the, uh, the source of genetic uh, um, resources uh, and uh, traditional knowledge associated with the genetic resources in pat patent applications. And uh, th this is an issue that people are, didn't really expect to be in a diplomatic conference this year. It's been a, lo a long negotiation. In some ways it's, it's considered a really narrow treaty because it just deals with the disclosure issue of the source of uh, genetic information and any traditional knowledge that's related to the um, uh, genetic, um, the use of the genetic uh, uh, materials in the invention. Um, some of the negotiations are, kind of, are highly technical about when the obligation kicks in and, and uh, 
but uh, one thing that we focused on, and, and, and I've written a paper on it uh, that I published recently with Claire Cassidy, has to do with the with the uh, 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 the, the enforcement chapter in the agreement. And one of the concerns we have is that the enforcement chapter is pretty weak in the early in the basic proposal that they started with. And we were told that here that a, a, a com, uh, sort of a deal was made between some of the people asking for the treaty, particularly indigenous communities in some countries, that to get into the diplomatic conference, they had to agree to very weak enforcement measures in return to get the status of an international treaty on these issues. Now, uh, the particular uh, area that we focused on is whether or not, if, a, if there's a failure to disclose in the agreement, uh, can, can, if there's a failure to disclose, can you, um, um, can, 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 can you revoke the patent? Can you say, you know, if you don't disclose, then uh, you, you, you don't get the patent? And, and that's not allowed except in cases of fraud. So they made it very difficult to uh, revoke a patent for a non-disclosure in, in, in the version of the text that have been discussed here. And I think that's one of the sort of hardest issues to resolve right now in this negotiation or just, just how hard it will be to, to revoke a patent or if it'll, it would be possible at all. And uh, the paper that I wrote with Claire Cassidy, look at the experience in the United States where you can revoke a patent for a failure to disclose. Well, not revoke it. You can actually, the government can actually take title to a patent if you, if you refuse to disclose the government funding in the invention. And the U.S. has done that before, but they haven't done it very much. And uh, there's been very lax enforcement in the United States of the enforcement measures. But one of the consequences of the lax enforcement measures in the United States has been that the, uh, 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 the companies are very kind of, you know, they're not very good at disclosing or the universities are not very good at disclosing. So you have, you have cases where some research institutes, for example, only um, disclose about half the time uh, when they should uh, that they had government funding and inventions. And sometimes the disclosures come very late. There's one that was involved, Gleevec, a, a, a Norvatus uh, cancer drug, where the, the, the disclosure came uh, so, something like, uh, like, 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 I think more than 17 years after the patent application. Um, and so late disclosures or no disclosures are a common problem you see. And there's been like several reports by like the HHS Inspector General or the General, um, um, General County Office, I mean, uh, reports by auditing agencies in the United States that have complained about this. And there were some changes in the U.S. law in the regulations about how to enforce this provision in 2018 in the United States, right before the COVID pandemic, which make it e will make it easier for the U.S. to come in and take title to patents when there's a non-disclosure in an effort to um, enhance some of the compliance with the, uh, the provision. So here, the, the revoking of the patents or, or, or anything like that is, is, is really restricted in this agreement. In fact, it's so restrictive in the agreement that according to analysis that uh, uh, that, that, that Sean Flynn and, and uh, Andreas, his colleague this year, have looked at they, uh, several countries that have laws on the books on required disclosure of genetic resources would actually have to amend their laws to make the enforcement provisions weaker if the treaty passes than they are right now. Now, uh, I think that, that that's one of the last things that we solved in the uh, treaty on, uh, on um, uh, genetic resources and, and traditional knowledge. So, uh, next Monday, the World Health Assembly starts, and there's a whole range of issues uh, that'll be discussed at the World Health Assembly, and that'll be, I'll be here for that as well. So it's been a uh, um, fairly intense thing. So uh, for, for people that are kind of mad because I haven't done some of the work that maybe I overpromised to do and I, I'm behind on, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, this has been a really highly distractive uh, uh, thing. And so uh, anyway, I have to get up to the... I have to get up to the venues right now. Thank you very much.